So, ahlan wa sahlan, bonjour, marhaba to everybody. I am so excited, first time in Oregon, and I didn't want you to be reading about me. This is not about me, this is about the music that is coming out of a very exciting region in the world, the Arab world, the region so demonized often and so, you know, we're getting sick of the systematic demonization, I think, of the Arab world, whether we're Muslims, Christians, or Jews coming from there, you know, we're all facing this kind of era now where before you say hello, people are talking about you and assuming things about you, and they're assuming things about cultural productions coming out of the Middle East. So, um, you know, it was interesting to ask people about, well, what do you think of Middle Eastern music? And not just ask Americans, ask people who have nothing to do with the Middle East, and you get such different answers to what I think is really going on in terms of a new movement in the uh, music scene in the Arab world. So my uh, lecture, uh, I called it uh, today, um, let me go up here, I called it Arab Spring Music from Revolution to Revelation. I was gonna call it Arab Spring Music, you know, like spring to winter, because I think a lot of people think, well, the Arab Spring didn't work, it turned into this dreadful winter, it was hijacked, it didn't lead to anything. And for the most part, I agree that it was hijacked, and I agree that the high hopes that we used to have for the Arab Spring when it first started in Tunisia um, are dashed. But I'm gonna argue two points today through the music. One, the journey is not ended. What kind of revolution is gonna end within 10 years? A lot of revolutions continue. So we might be going through an era of winter in terms of music and revolutions, but the winter is not the end. There will be more seasons to come. And I think the music you're gonna to see today is gonna to give you hope and inspire you that these young people continue to do it. And number two, that the, that the uh, music that fueled the Arab Spring and that made it, I think, possible uh, because of the internet technology and uh, using Twitter and other things was really a, a music-fueled revolution. It spilled over into many other countries, and although the Arab Spring may not have come to fruition in those other Arab countries, the music that was spread by the Arab Spring, by Tunisian music, by Egyptian musicians like Rami Hassam and others, that music has continued to be disseminated, sometimes secretly, through the internet into other Arab countries. So that we are finding more than ever young Arab musicians, no matter where they are in the Arab world, speaking very bravely still against the government, still for equality, women's rights, the right to wear the hijab or not to wear the hijab. The, all of these uh, topics are still going on and I think you're gonna see them in the music. They are reflected in the music. So I have made a, uh, uh, a kind of a playlist on YouTube. Um, you saw the URL over there. And, uh, I, I tried to have Tagreed uh, Khouri uh, send you the URL, but you don't have to have it. I printed it out here. Uh, basically, today you can kick back and enjoy as I take you down the list. Now, let me tell you, Mr. Youssef, who I just met, that this has 50 songs and uh, video clips and they're chronological. I tried my best so that you can see what came first and how it went into other countries. So it was kind of chronological and geographical. It's an impossible task because how can you? It's not always gonna line up. Of course today, I want to hear your reactions to these videos. So I don't wanna you know, play the whole three minute video and waste your time. This is all on YouTube. Go back and whatever you like today, the little samples, discover more. And certainly I'm just gonna play a few samples from the list as we go down. And so you know, out of 50 videos, if we play, I don't know, five to 10, we're fine. Uh, depending on your reaction too. If I see you nodding off, I'll go, okay, none of that. We'll move to something more uh, energetic or something. But the music also has very different genres. And I think everybody here sh will, inshallah, find an artist or a song that they'll connect to and that will be your ticket into going back on YouTube and through this list, you know, type that artist, see what else they've been doing. Uh, so a lot of the songs you're gonna see here are actually the artist's very first song, which made an impact and fueled people to go into the streets and gave us, us initially a very optimistic view of the future in the Arab world. So, um, is everybody ready to begin our musical journey? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay, who speaks Arabic? 
Who doesn't speak Arabic? Oh, perfect. It's, it's a perfect audience because my, uh, my talk is to show a lot of Arabic speaking people how even us Arabs are not aware of some of these musicians. So hopefully you're going to be very pleasantly surprised at some of the Lebanese underground musicians, you know, these amazing men and women who come from Beirut who are doing amazing stuff with no, you know, commercial success, but with a lot of artistic integrity. And there, those who don't speak Arabic, the videos that I have here uh, are mostly subtitled. I tried to have English subtitles, which, you know, was not easy, but I was able to get you that. Although I think that the music and the visuals can sometimes be so independently strong that you don't even need to speak the language. I listen to songs in other languages all the time. And if someone just comes and tells me this is about this, I can feel the song. And hopefully that will happen for those who don't speak Arabic. So we're going to begin our journey in Tunisia today and with the advent of the Arab Spring. And that started uh, in, we have a specific date, which is 18th of December, 2010. I mean, what revolution do you know has a specific day where it's our specific event that triggered it? We could go to the day the month, the year, the hour, and it was this merchant, I don't know if you've heard of, uh, about him, uh, his name was Muhammad Aziz, and on that day, 18th of December 2010, he set himself on fire, and he did so out of protest, out of frustration with the way the Tunisian government was functioning, with the ruling system, and in doing so, he echoed the frustrations and the sadness of the whole entire nation. The Tunisians uh, were and still are some of the most literate, educated people in the Arab world, and yet all these PhDs and all this knowledge, and they couldn't find a job doing anything within there. Not only that, they were heavily censored, they couldn't do anything. So when he set himself on fire, he became emblematic of the whole country, and although this self-immolation, you know, was a tragic event, out of that grew the protest in the street. Out of the fact that there was now something called the internet that the Tunisian revolution was, uh, the Tunisian government wasn't very familiar with, young people could mobilize, yalla yalla, we're gonna meet in the street. By the time the government found out, it was too late. So when they went into the streets, you know, and started the demonstration, it was unstoppable at that point time and masses started to come and people telling each other, uh, you know, and by the time the government figured out how to block Facebook and how to, you know, in 2010, it was a little too late. People were using VPNs and, you know, the revolution continued. So it started in Tunisia on that day and, uh, and the song that really went along with the event was the very first song you're seeing over there. It is by uh, a rapper from Tunisia whose name is El General. And this guy, El General, whose real name is Hamada Ben Amer, of course he would have never revealed his, his real name in 2010 when he was singing against you know, the Tunisian regime. Uh, so he became known as El General, and through the magic of the internet, he, uh, his song was being disseminated left and right, and it became the anthem to the, to the uh, very first revolution, the very first uh, reactionary sound. So we all know in Arabic the chant, Asham yurid esklaf al-nivam, the people want to overthrow the system. That grew out of, the, out of this song. And so this song is called Ra'is Liblad, and that means president of the country. And it's an ode, it's like he's writing a letter to the president of his country, he's Tunisian, he's writing to this, what he perceives as a dictator, of course, and writing to him saying, you know, we, your people are living like dogs, we are, have nothing to eat, we're being treated like this, like that, like that. Oh, president of the country, do something about it, you know. So it's also the power of hip hop, Maybe some of you didn't know, but Arabic hip-hop is alive and well. They borrowed it from the West and gave it a twist of our own so that we're using that genre to talk about our own issues, not to copy, just for copying's sake. So are you ready to hear the song that started it all by El General? It's called Raiz Leblad, President of the Country. <laughs> The way 
I'm envisioning this, everybody, is instead of me playing these videos and speaking and then at the end having someone say, well, the second video you played 25 minutes ago, I want it. Let's see if we can get immediate reactions to what you saw. It'll be also more interactive. And of course, at the end, we can talk about it thematologically. So who, I would love to hear, wherever you're from, doesn't matter. What was your reaction to watching and hearing El General singing uh, the song, Raiz Lebad, President of the Country? And it does not have to be a positive reaction. Yalla, Diala, Khabrina. Tell us, you are your husband, you are your delegate. Go ahead. I'm just struck uh, the similarity to Tupac's song, Dear Mr. President, and also to Flash's uh, original song about the conditions of people living in the but, but But also being sort of applied to Tunisia. I don't think it's a coincidence. I think those are, there is you know, an influence there. I keep hearing like he looks like Eminem. Like, I don't know, you know, that's, again, a deliberate thing. But I don't like copying, you know, when you take like something Western, you just copy it so you can be cool like the West. That's different. This is much different. The lyrics that he wrote are potent, and they're very, and they're in this amazing Arabic, Tunisian dialect, and they're about Tunisia. All right, so I think the rest of you are waiting for me to go to Amal Maslusi to react. I, I'm getting that vibe yeah. from the room. <laughs> they, they want to react too quickly. Yeah, you're coming up next, young lady. Um, and so uh, uh, I want to talk to you about this young lady. Her name is uh, Amal Maslusi. She is really the voice of the Tunisian Revolution. <laughs> a fiercely independent, she was a uh, woman. She was. Uh, in her 20s when she would take her guitar and this red coat that you're seeing here and go down to the street of Tunisia armed with nothing but her guitar and sometimes nothing but her voice. And she sang this song, which is called Kilmeti Hurra, which means my word is free and unencumbered. Free in the sense that no one's gonna stop me from speaking. And so she has an angelic voice, prepared to have goosebumps, everybody. And so she's gonna, when she sings out the song, Kilmeti Hurra, you can see the masses, like, just going, go Amal, talk Amal, tell them Amal, you know, and she's almost afraid of the responsibility they're putting on her shoulders, she's young, but she sings it. And let's now fast forward to after the Tunisian Revolution, after the fall of the regime, she went from being arrested by the Tunisian government, tortured by the Tunisian government, to now honorary citizen of Tunisia, who was sent to the Nobel Prize uh, ceremony to sing this song with a 72-piece orchestra. That same song you're gonna hear now with just her voice has turned into a worldwide sensation. And I'm gonna show you both. So we'll see Amal the way she started. Very simple, very sweet, armed with nothing but her voice and see what happens to Amal now. And side note, I brought Amal to Stanford University. I was, I was the happiest day of my life. Wow. Right, Amal Maslouthi, the voice of the Tunisian Revolution. What a contrast between simple Amal, Amal the young Amal, the optimistic Amal in the streets, to this sort of coronation, I think, of a Tunisian singer at the uh, um, at the Nobel Prize uh, ceremony. So, anybody has any reaction to Amal Maslusi? I know her, I may just convey your reaction to her. Anybody want to react to Amal Maslusi? I mean, I remember the first time I saw the video of, the, of her in the street. It was a different one than you showed, but yeah. I mean, she's just crying. Oh, crying, good, good. Yeah. Do you speak Arabic? Uh, was Shui. Shui. Masri, yeah. so Masri. Was like, this was the beginning. Egyptian dialect. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, she sings in a Tunisian dialect, which is why I think you and me, as non-Tunisian dialect speakers, may find some words odd. But I think with a little subtitles, we totally got it, right? I mean, you were able to follow the Arabic, I think, uh, comfortably. And it made you cry the first time you saw it. I mean, I don't remember when it was, but it wasn't so far after. I 
remember when. Was it after I, Mubarak, uh, after it, the fall of the regime? It Rishi? probably was after or during the Egyptian Revolution. The Egyptian Revolution, yeah. Because yeah. 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 so you're giving me, the, well, the you're giving me a great segue, because that song spilled into Egypt, and that's like totally where I'm heading, is that how the, the music of the Arab Spring in Tunisia, which led to at least a better change in the system in Tunisia, <laughs> spilled into Egypt. And what happened when it got to Egypt was, you're talking protests, they made Tunisian protests look small. Yeah. I've never seen Tahrir Square so <laughs> vibrant and so energized. And of course, Egypt's history is filled with revolutions and sacrifices. So, um, when, when to, uh, Amal's voice and El General's voice reached uh, Tahrir Square, I think they must have somehow influenced Rami Isam. Does anyone here know who Rami Isam is? They're the only one. So I think they should know. Don't you think that people should know who Rami Isam is? Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, who is Masri we مش كده؟ أستاذي أستاذي أه 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 kind of person. Good. Because if you like mainstream Arabic music, if that's all you like, if that's all you know, if you like Im Kalthum, the legend of legends, I live for her. I Fairuz, fine. But if you like that kind of music, you're gonna hate Rami Isam because it's all counter tradition. And so he may take Um Kalthum, but then you know he may dub her voice with like hip hop sounds or whatever. So the, the idea is not to continue. I mean, if you want love and poetry and music, go for it. But if you want revolution, I don't think Feirou's peaceful, beautiful voice is gonna it'll lead you to ecstasy, not revolution. So basically, Rami Isam was the um, Tunis, the Egyptian example equivalent to El General in Tunisia. And Rami Isam, I mean, this was back when Mubarak was in power, and Mubarak, having learned from Tunisia and how quickly a system can be overturned, was ruthless. I mean, I'm, whether you liked him at first or not, his response was ruthless. And basically, uh, Rami Isam was tortured, but we're not talking just tortured. I mean, he was permanently damaged physically and mentally. And he would take his guitar and go down to Tahrir Square, then they would disappear and people would be like, oh, they took Rami again. And then a few months, sometimes later, he'd come out bruised and whatever, right from the jail door to Tahrir Square with the guitar, bandaged up, get back up there and start singing for, you know. So that was, you know, it was not to be silenced. And of course, once he became kind of a household name among the new generation, it was harder for the government to, uh, you know, kidnap him and not say where he is because now there was demand. And then it, he, he uh, became known internationally as the voice of the Egyptian revolution. So I'm gonna show you Rami Isam in action in Tahrir Square. <laughs> these videos on YouTube, but I wanted him to, I wanted you to hear him talk about what he's been through because it informs the song that he did. So a lot of songs in Egypt now, he is in exile and he lives in Sweden now. He's, he can't go back because as we know with Egypt, they went from one system to another to another with Sisi. We were hoping things would change with Sisi. We were hoping things would, you know, the blood of the martyrs in Egypt would not have gone, uh, you know. Uh, I still believe that it's all part of a process and I think that the Sisi regime is just part of a eventual freedom that we're gonna find. But as things stand, Sisi is, uh, 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 he hates Sisi and Sisi hates him, so obviously he can't go back to Egypt. But from Sweden, he continues to, to record in Arabic and to release these songs that talk about freedom in Egypt. 
Here's one called Aish Hurriya Adala Iktimaiya, which means uh, bread, freedom, and social justice. You're going to see a very Polish Rami. Now that he's living in Sweden and has a record label, he's able to have subtitled videos in HD quality, a little different than what he did there. But again, and the message is still uh, that of a revolutionary young singer who would like to return to Egypt and cannot, and who has been tortured, and who is disillusioned with uh, Egypt today. Okay. So any reactions to Rami I saw then, Rami I saw him now, Rami I saw him period. Yes? Well, at the beginning of the video, it said Anna Wadif and he like walked past it, the wall, yeah. the graffiti, and I kind of felt a more like an angrier vibe than he initially was. I think um, before this, I think it was more of like a, a sense of sadness, a sense of um, just being generally upset, but I think this is more angry. Like more anger. I agree. And do you think it's because he's safely in Sweden when yes. he started yes. doing this that he was able to? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Isn't it sad that he can't do this in his own country or even in a neighboring Arab country? I mean, he has to go all yeah, the way no, and get asylum in, yeah. in Sweden. Yeah. yeah, I'm glad you noticed that. You must yeah. read that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yes? Um, when was that video that you made? Uh, it was so the song, let's see, the video itself. Let's go back to see. Right I, I thought it was made um, for you. Well, it's part of the, the song may be, but the video I think was after um, the regime was toppled and Rami had to go. So let's see how many. So we're talking 2011, no, you're right. It's pretty much right, right there. Um, it was done maybe before. There's a new one mm -hmm. that I'm thinking about. Have you seen the new one against CC? Yes, he's got the fur. And, Yes, yeah, that that's the Swedish. Very big change. Yeah, yeah. Actually, I mean, I, I wish I had time to do that, but thank you for bringing that up. So, yes, this song and the album actually were still around the time where he was in Egypt, maybe tr uh, being tortured and moving, and the words, of course, make sense that way. But what did you think of the new Rami in Egypt? like decked out in this like feather and leather and thing. I think people now want to see what that looks like. Um, but. Like um, a, a hippie version of Rami. I guess anarchy is the best word for something like that. But did you feel like, this is the one right, Balha? Balha I think is the one. We're talking about this video, guys. Um, this is him now in, in, in Sweden. Singing against the um, So, this is definitely in Sweden. This is definitely more recent if you look at the date here, 2018. Um, but it's also, I think, the most blatantly insulting song to CC. I mean, he names him and he likens him to insects and uh, parasites and you know things like that. So um, it is, I think that is because he's a problem. That, that song, if had been released where he was anywhere near Egypt today, he might have gotten a special visit even if he wasn't in the country. Uh, he is gutsy, he continues to do this. So, you know, Egyptian TV hates this video. I have satellite TV I watch from Egypt. You would think this video like just the devil incarnate, you know because he's naming CC, and of course it's a media c control, I mean government controlled media at this point. Um, okay, if you want to move to another country, where <laughs> shall we go next? When we think of the Arab Spring and after Egypt, where do you think the Arab Spring spilled into? Syria. Syria. All the above. And so I'm going to, just I went to Libya next, thinking let's we'll stay in North Africa. And of course, Libya with Gaddafi and all this, you know, I guess, uh, you know, was probably one of the most tragic consequences. Again, I say it's not the end because there still is to this day an amazing amount of Libyan young men and women musicians who are producing songs in Libyan dialect, speaking against the government, speaking against the Western corruption, speaking about everything. And you're doing it secretly through the internet. The thing you're going to like the most or find interesting about the Libyan artists 
is that they don't give their real names usually because that they would be asking for it. But um, so they have you know these nicknames, and one of those nicknames is Ibn Thabit, and Ibn Thabit is probably the voice of the Libyan Revolution. He is uh, the, he's finally gained recognition where he's working with some Western uh, musicians who sent him uh, what we call loops, you know, and he uses that to bring his message across. And so I'm going to show you his uh, his kind of song. It's uh, let's play the one the Nida. Yeah. So knowing the subtitles, but could you hear the anger <laughs> in his voice? And for those who speak some Arabic, maybe the Libyan dialect. But again, I mean, he was likening Libya to Tunisia and to uh, Egypt, but saying we're not getting the same results here in Libya. Unfortunately, that's the Arab Spring in uh, Libya was extinguished, well, not extinguished, was silenced or attempted to be silenced. Uh, what did anybody want to react to Ibn Thabit from Libya? Is it weird for you guys to hear like hip hop, which we associate, you know, with New York and, you know, civil rights here being used with, from, by these Arab musicians? It's not weird because you guys are like living in America. It's pretty weird for a lot of Arab listeners who are in the Middle East, you know, and they go, hey, Shada, what they are you doing? They take the nap and they do the, you know. And it's like, I think it's very powerful because I think to me, I, I never understood rap when I was younger. Then when I started to read it, I'm like, this is poetry. This is modern poetry. This is poetry that this generation can lead. It's not just baby, 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 you know. And there is a, there's a message. So I think that uh, a lot of Arabs don't understand the powerful lyrics in these. And I tried it on, I mean, I'm old, but I tried it on the even older generation by telling them, here, read this thing. And it was like a rap song by um, Ibn Thabit. And they read it and they go, that's some of the most powerful imagery. And I go, but why is it not in classical Arabic? I said, well, you know, a lot of writers don't write in classical Arabic these days. Let them get away with that. But it's particularly powerful the way he evocated you know. And that song, they go, well, that was the same song that you heard and dismissed <laughs> in the rap. So it's lyrics. But of course, they're not targeting that generation, my dad, my late father's generation. They're targeting the new generation, and so bringing it in with that rhythmic pattern, I think you get much more results. All right, well, I'm going to move from Libya to Lebanon. Yusuf is happy. And so, I mean, what was the Arab Spring in Lebanon? The Lebanese, and I'm born and raised in Lebanon, and the best childhood was in Lebanon before the war in 75, because it didn't matter who was Christian, who was, you know, Muslim, didn't matter. I did not know who's, you know, we all had our private religions, and we co coexisted in this utopia that ended in 75, when suddenly it became like Ramzi Salti, are you Muslim or Christian? And then it became, are you, if you're a Christian, are you Maronite or Greek Orthodox, or are you Sunni or Shia? And that was not the Lebanon I knew, so we left Lebanon in 75, went to Jordan, and, <clears throat> you know, I recently have been going back to Lebanon, trying to see, you know, it's a lot better, it is, it's a lot of problems, but it's a lot better, but ignore all that. The music scene in Lebanon, the underground music scene, is booming. They are amazing. That single little country is producing more musicians, speaking about more stuff and more creative stuff than the whole Arab world combined. And I don't say that, I say that objectively, because I'm the first to say there are so many problems in Lebanon that, are, that need to be addressed. But in terms of music, they are setting the scale. And I bring it down to one band. Who's heard of Mashru Alayla? Ah, I have cool people. You've heard Mashru Alayla. So, I mean, I think Mashru Alayla kind of piggybacked on the, on the music of the Arab Spring. And I would even argue that if people hadn't heard that revolutionary music coming in from Tunisia and, and Egypt and, and Libya and all that, 
maybe they would have never been heard, period, because they think about what is considered really taboo subjects and really controversial topics. And of course, Nashro Leila, the band, the Lebanese band, is banned mm -hmm. in so many Arab countries. It was kind of heartbreaking to see that Jordan banned them recently yeah. twice mm -hmm. after tickets were sold out. So what does that tell you? It tells you when they, this Lebanese band goes to Jordan, the Jordanian generation, you know, the young generation, the youth, are buying it, you can't get a ticket. But so the, the demand is there, the thirst is there, and the appreciation is there. And then you get some government official who says, oh no, we just learned that the lead singer from Mashur Alayla is openly gay. That is unacceptable, so the whole concert is gone. What about the rest of the event? Doesn't matter, you know. So they've been banned on the sole basis of the fact that the lead singer from Mashur Alayla decided to speak about that. And I guess he felt that in an era where we're speaking against governments and for the rights of women and for the rights of uh, interfaith marriage and all the things that the Arab Spring music is doing, we need to address the issue of marginalized sexualities in the Arab world. And I think that uh, he's very gutsy to have done that. But as a result, of course, there's a lot of hate mail. You can't... Um, sort of mention the name Mashru Layla without getting somebody to either applaud their courage or spit on the ground in disgust. Uh, so here he is, his name is uh, Hamid Sinno, he is the lead singer of the group Mashru Layla, which means Layla's Project or Project of One Night, Layla Layla. So. And uh, there were a bunch of students from the American University in Beirut, AUB, who got together to do a music workshop. None of them were, uh, were, you know, musicians. And basically, um, they came out with this song that became infectious and the spread, and then the rest is history. They were in San Francisco, near where I live. You couldn't find a ticket on the streets. There were scalpers. You went? Yeah. You're lucky. Who's the lucky person who went? You're very lucky. Did you, you probably bought a ticket early or something. Yeah. People were like, oh my God, we'll pay anything. Now, it makes sense because, of course, San Francisco is looking at it also from uh, you know, a very sort of liberal city that way. So they were embracing his sexuality, in a sense, and celebrating that. But I was surprised to see how many Arabs would, uh, were in the audience and they would say, well, I don't agree with this personal choice. Obviously, that's against my <clears throat> principles. But the music is so dang good that they would go and enjoy it. So let me give you a sample of what, of what they're doing. And uh, they're just going to they're about to release a new album, amazing videos. They're really a very educated bunch. <coughs> and, uh, like them or, or hate them, they are making an impact. Ooh, you'll be controversial. Nobody wants to talk about Mr. Ronald. Uh, so f you, you knew who they were. I saw you raised your hand. I really like them. You do like them. Yeah. yeah. And uh, have you had a chance to talk to people who may not like them? No. Or read really. something? Yeah. Because really. yeah, you're like, in, my in kind Palestine, of. In Palestine, everybody, like, I know, that loves Mashallah. Uh, I'm not trying to impose any kind of, you know, moral compass upon anybody, but it, it, the song isn't necessarily about his private life. There are a few. But most of the songs are like, you know, tomorrow will be a better day, things are going to conquer, there's going to be equality, the Arab world's going to unite, da, da, da. So it's too bad that some people dismiss the whole repertoire because of this guy's private life, you know. <laughs> Having said that, I mean, it takes a lot of guts to be called the first openly gay Arab singer in yeah. history. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I just have a question. Uh, if uh, Jordan Bantman, um couldn't the just go to Lebanon to see them? Yes, but a lot of them did. Okay. <laughs> and I think they tried to go, what they, I mean, they really, they tried to go to Egypt, of course. Did you hear what happened in Egypt? No. That's a whole other thing, and I don't know how much we want to take the conversation that way, but um, th when they were in Egypt a year ago, some people in the audience, some young people, we're talking like 18, 19, in solidarity with the fact that he's singing on stage, pulled the gay flag up, the, the rainbow flag, in the audience. So, of course, the, the, the band immediately became banned. In although, in, 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 Egypt, in Egypt, in Egypt. And so they banned them in Egypt immediately. 
But it wasn't the band that carried the flag, it was someone in the audience, right? But the very fact that they could stir someone into doing that, they were banned fine, so they could never go to Egypt. But every kid who held that flag, no, we don't even know if they were doing it out of solidarity or personal or whatever. Add to add, it's insult to injury. If you've seen the last Musalsa, like the last TV series by Adil Imam, in last Ramadan, Afari, they, yeah, they depicted the same scene, they depicted the same concert from the point of view of the government, mm -hmm. and they said, like, this is a bad shit. Yeah. And, but they didn't name Mashrua Layla probably they didn't, they didn't by name, 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 but everyone knew. Everything everyone about knew. the event, yeah. everything about there, it reminds you of that thing that happened with Mashrua Layla. And of course, what would be the argument there, young man? It would be that they're bringing Western concepts of sexuality into the Arab world, or maybe they're, you know, as if that did not exist throughout our history in the Arab world. Let's go back to the Abbasi age and to Abu Nuwas. I think it suffices yeah. to just find that encyclopedia. <laughs> Uh, you know, so, so there is that, and, but again, instead of embracing them, because they're making an impact on the world, and they're going around saying the Arab world is not what it is. He said, um, um, what's his name, Hamid Sinno from Mashroo Alayda, said in the streets of America, he's more afraid to be Muslim than to be gay. And so, you know, it's almost like he understands that Islamophobia is trumping uh, homophobia. All right, so I'm going to end with a beautiful combination of Palestine and Syria. And I'm doing this as a special dedication to somebody here who likes Shadia Mansour. She is the first lady of Palestinian hip hop. She's amazing. She is fearless. And, you know, the Palestinians were kind of, you know, trying to ride the wave of the Arab Spring music, but of course their situation is a lot different because it, the struggle had started decades before. And in some way trying to say, well, if people are paying attention to the oppressed and the marginalized, maybe we could get our um, artists and our message across through song. And I think Shadia Mansour does that beautifully with her. She wears the kufiya, the Palestinian kufiya, and she sings fearlessly, and she's got a great voice, and she's an independent woman, and she balances femininity with feminism, and she's just amazing. And if that's not enough, combine her with Syrian American rapper Omar Ofendam, who does, who talks about Syria and what's going on in Syria. He has a song called Hashtag Syria that's like probably the most powerful Syrian um, uh, song to talk about what's going on there. Combine Omar Ofendam, of Syrian American rapper, with Palestinian uh, singer Shadia Mansour and you get one of the most powerful videos I've seen. Um, this must have taken so long they got the actual archival um, uh, pictures from Palestinian families before 48, after 48, and then pictures from Syria, and they put them together to kind of show how the more things the more uh, change, the more they stay the same. Uh, the only thing is, I'm not sure this has, I don't think this has subtitles. So if not, they're just singing about, you know, being in a generation where things have to change, including us as Arabs or as Arab American. We also need to change the way we're doing things. Um, it's not enough to ask for change from the outside, we need to change from the inside. If you gee a stone, they'll give you a palace, give them a piece of grass, they'll give you a tree. I mean, it's just been my experience that music heals, and when you take everything away from people, the one thing you can't take away is music. Um, Tahrid was saying also that, you know, when, when Americans listen to this kind of music, and unfortunately I agree, I mean, they don't even know where the countries, not even, but you know, a lot of people don't even know where those countries are, what are their histories, so when you play a song and you say, this is coming from, you know, Mauritania, and it's this, they don't even know where that Mauritania's official language is actually Arabic. I mean, so then, you know, it becomes like you're playing this indie music from Mauritania when people don't even, you know, it's like you assume you know Fayrouz and Kulthum if you hear these, because a lot of times they're saying we grew up to that music, so they think that. Us. So, uh, Tahrid, you are right, and yes, let us collaborate and let us continue, and let this kind of space become a mini universe for the launching of a united um, um, 
diverse uh, Arab world that will shake things up in a good way and change Western perceptions of us. Uh, yeah, yes, me. please. Since they are university students and they are interested in this, they all have a pretty, you know, a good idea of where the countries oh, are. No, no, not this audience. You, you, you wouldn't have come to my talk if you were the people <laughs> I'm talking about. Uh, you know, they wouldn't, they wouldn't care about the Arab world music, much the less indie music. But please go on. Yeah, no, no. But I'm saying they, they are very interested, and I. I thank you, I really enjoy it. I mean, thank I'm just you. talking. Thank this you. is the group of America, do so you speak, know where places Do you speak are. some Arabic? Uh, um, no. 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 Yeah, no. We, uh, no. Access. yes. I was hoping she'd say no, but, but I guess she does. <laughs> because, I mean, my whole point is the music is sometimes moving without, you don't need the language. I think it's, these are like so much language based. Uh, if, if, you know, between some subtitles and some context, some context, yeah. You can enjoy it without the subtitles. I don't think that you need to know what every word means, but rather listen to the voice, listen to the anger, listen to the joy, listen to the sadness. Um, it comes through, and because they fuse Arabic music with Western genres, like hip hop, they, it can appeal to both people in America that we're talking about, but also people in the Arab world who don't even know that next door to you lives a young musician who's been singing for freedom and, and because they don't get the acknowledgement of the Arab world. They're not Hishik Vishik. They're not Nancy Ajram. They're not just out to make us feel good. They actually are trying to defy something. So you, you, there's, it's a dual thing. It's like, I got a lot of Arabs saying, it took your show in America for me to hear a guy who actually turned out to live two streets down from me and I'd see this kid, you know, literally, this is a story. <laughs> Same street. <laughs> and then when I heard him on your radio, suddenly he goes up to him and goes, oh my God, sing again. You know? <laughs> so it's sad that sometimes you need like a, a stamp of Western legitimacy to see something that was right there. And, and they are everywhere, these amazing musicians who will sacrifice everything to produce music, and who's, who hope that we will hear them, no matter where we are, and help them, and support them, and stand up for equality. Mm -hmm. Muhammad. 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 Muhammad.